Now let's talk about the energy auditing process. We're going to identify the steps in a home energy audit, and then we're going to kind of look at some additional subjects that will be covered as we move forward in our audit. Really, our audit process breaks down into three steps. We have the pre-audit, we have the audit, and then we have the post-audit. In our pre-audit, we need to make sure that we get a request for the energy bills because we want to want to look at those energy bills and understand uh, the trending and what's going on with the home before we get there energy-wise. When we're going to the audit, we want to make sure first off that we get there early. If we're supposed to be there at 9, rolling up in front of the house at 9 o'clock is not where we want to be. We want to be there early. We want to be able to get our equipment together, get our photos of the exterior of the house taken, get all of our paperwork together so that when we get to the house, if it's 9 o'clock, we're supposed to be at 9 o'clock, we're knocking on the door right at 9 o'clock. We want to make sure that we're prepared. And when I say prepared, we want to make sure that we have all of our equipment, but we also want to make sure that we have things like extra batteries because... When your equipment fails because you don't have batteries, where you are, no, in, you are in the middle of nowhere and you can't finish your job because of $2 batteries, okay? Make sure that you have a safety talk with yourself. You are the safety officer. If you did something stupid yesterday and you got away with it, make sure you remind yourself to not do it again today. When you're in this business, and you're working as a building analyst, you're typically working for one of three entities. Either you're working for an auditing body, and that's all they do is audits, or you're working for a weatherization agency, that's a government agency, and you're gonna go out and do an audit, and your results you're gonna hand off to a crew, and they're gonna come do the work, or you're working for a weatherization company, and the weatherization company is like the government agency, except it's not a done deal. Your job is to go out and do the audit and then convince the homeowner to write a check so that your crews can do the work. So in all three of those cases, there are going to be some amount of paperwork that needs to be done and signed. So that's typically the first thing you're going to do after you get your picture's taken, your equipment together, you knock on the door, you meet the homeowner, introduce yourself, present your credentials, and then you have papers for them to sign. While they're taking care of the paperwork, typically you're going to walk the exterior of the building. You walk the exterior of the building, make your drawings, um, take all your measurements, and at that point you're ready to go. So paperwork's done, you put the paperwork away, then you start the client interview. In the client interview, you're going to find out things like, do they have comfort issues? You're going to find out um, if you haven't already collected the bills, you're going to want to collect their a year's worth of energy bills from them at that point. You're going to find out, do they have any kinds of health issues? Every winter time, you know, they fire on the furnace, and then everybody comes down with the flu. Hmm. Could be ducks could be bad filters, also could be carbon monoxide, right? Coincide, you turn the furnace on, everybody gets sick. In the spring, you turn the furnace off, everybody gets well. Hmm. And you're going to find out what the chief complaints are of the homeowner. Why are, they th why are you here? I mean, that's probably the most important piece of information, right? Why are you here? Okay? If you're here because their energy bills are too high, that's different than if you're here because the daughter's bedroom is cold, which is different from, I just want to be as green as I possibly can. You want to make sure you understand the goal of the homeowner so that you can deliver what they are looking for, not what you think is a good idea. Then you also want to find out how many people live in the house? How many pets do you have? Why, why is that, those two pieces of information really important? Dog doors, you're going to be looking for those. How much traffic is in and out of the house? What else? Mark. Taking showers, all kinds of stuff. 
Okay, so. Okay, so if we have lots of people, we know our heat load's going to be higher. We know our laundry load's going to be higher. They got three or four kids or something like that. What else? Okay. How about, um, how about our air requirements, our minimum ventilation requirements? Is that going to be affected by the number of people? Yeah. You know, let's say you have a family that doesn't have a lot of money, so they've got three or four kids in a two-bedroom house. Okay, that building's going to be smaller. You might be able to meet the minimum ventilation requirements for the size of building, but because there are more people living in that building, they are going to require more ventilation than if there was just a couple or a single person living in that same structure. So that's something else that we have to keep in mind. Once we get started with our interview, then the next thing we're going to want to do is meter our refrigerator. Um, our refrigerator is probably our biggest consumer of electrical energy because it runs 24-7, 365. We want to make sure that we are, we, if we are metering, if that's our policy, we're metering our fridge, we want to meter the fridge for as long as we can. So we come in, we're interviewing the homeowner, we're going straight to the fridge to plug in the fridge because we want to see how much energy it uses. So the longer the time, the more accurate the information that we have. If you don't have a meter and you want to get this information, then you pull the make and model number and you go to Gamma I've not heard of, but you can go to Gamma, you can go to DIY, you can go to energystar.gov and you can look up the refrigerator and pull the average usage for that model of refrigerator. As a fridge gets older, if it's poorly maintained, it will become less efficient. But just because it's old doesn't mean it's in inefficient. Because back in the day, they made refrigerators that were efficient, more efficient than some of the cheap refrigerators that they build today. Okay, so really, you just, you either have, that's why you can't just assume. It's a collection of things, right? And when we get into appliances, we'll get into more detail, but it's the insulation, it's the type of motor, it's the way they manage the um, cooling going on inside the refrigerator, it's the condition of the weather seal, the weather stripping, it's all those things. Yeah, all of those things contribute. And for example, I'll tell you about a, a, one of the guy that I went to an audit on, and we were talking about his refrigerator. Right? And this, he had an old refrigerator. And I said to him, he, actually he said to me, I said to him, well, you might want to look at getting a new refrigerator. And he says, I haven't looked it up yet, I'm, but it's pretty old, so I'm thinking you might look into it. He says, you know what, they don't make refrigerators like this anymore. Right? And I, I guess he could get a pizza box in his freezer or something like that. Right? Okay? This is important to him. Important to him. So... So it's a comfort issue. So I get back, I'm writing my report, I take the model number, and I look up the model on the Energy Star website. Okay. Over five year period, now mind you, a, a life of a refrigerator is 10 years. That's what we say the life of a refrigerator, 10 years. In just five years, if he were to replace that refrigerator with an Energy Star model, same size, 15 hundred dollars he would save in five years by replacing that refrigerator with an energy star model that means over the life of a refrigerator over 10 years he could save three thousand dollars for three thousand dollars you could buy one of those refrigerators that's got the tv the tv in it you know i'm thinking to myself you know it's a good thing they don't make refrigerators like this anymore <laughs> You're going around the outside of the house. What are you looking for when you're running around the outside of the house? You're making measurements, looking for holes, gaps, gaps in the foundation. You're looking at windows, window quality. We're looking for a gas meter. And we're going to test our gas meter for leaks. We're also going to be uh, looking at drainage. How well does the property drain water away from the structure itself? 
We're also going to be looking at uh, gutters, rain gutters. Mm -hmm. Are they managing that properly? Also, we're going to be looking at the roof. What kind of condition is the roof in? Do we see whoop de doos in the roof, the roof that would indicate that maybe they have some water leakage problems? What are the condition of the shingles? Are the shingles new? Are they old? If they're new, why are they new? That's what we want to know. Are they new because they had leaking problems, leakage problems? If we talk to the homeowner and say, yeah, I, I had a leak in my roofs, so I had to have it fixed, and now I have new shingles, now when we get up in the attic, what are we going to be looking for? We're going to be looking for signs of moisture damage and microbial mold. mold. We're going to be looking for molds, right? What about the siding? We're going to be looking at siding. What is the condition, of the, the overall condition of the siding? But so those are the those are the basic things that we're going to be looking for as we move around the as we move around the house. We're going to be looking at the condition of things. We're going to be looking for things that look suspicious. For example, I was in a I was at a house and I'm walking around the outside and there's a big metal plate on the side of the, on the big on the side of the building. It's like what is that? Right? It's a door. It's a big metal door, but it's been screwed shut. So I'm making a note of it. I need to talk to the homeowner and find out what this is all about. Where is it? Where does it go? Has it been sealed properly? Because as it turns out, it's a coal chute, right? Mm -hmm. So back in the day when you had coal-fired furnaces, right, the coal guy would come and he would open the door and he would yeah. shovel coal into the, down the coal chute, right? So, yeah. so, the, so that was a, that's, a, that's a thermal weak spot in the house, right? right. So... It, it, and it's metal, and there's a hole. Has it been properly sealed? Has it been properly insulated? You know, these are things, because it's abandoned, it's not being used, right? Once we get done with the exterior inspection, then we need to come to the inside. Now, what I say about interior inspection is always do it the same way. Personally, I like to start at the top and make my way down. So I start in the attic, make my way down to the basement, because in the basement is usually where you find your fire-burning appliances gas burning appliances like your water heater and your furnace. It's usually down in the basement. And that's where we're going to do our combustion safety tests. So we start up at the top, we look in, start up in the attic, look at the attic, what's going on with insulation, do we have uh, moisture issues, is it properly ventilated, do we have a moisture barrier, those kinds of things. Then we come down to the first floor and we're looking at the ceiling, you know, do we have holes, what kind of light bulbs are they using? What do the windows look like? Are they single pane, double pane, triple pane? Do they have, uh, are they metal? Are they wood? Are they vinyl? Do we see condensation? Is there mold in there? What kind of blinds do they have? Are they using insulated blinds? Are they using uh, metal blinds? You know, what's going on with that, right? I'm looking at walls. I'm trying to determine what the wall insulation is. I want to look at, um, I'm looking at the floor because I'm looking for things like, things that are unusual. For example, do I see uh, outlets in the floor? Okay, what does that tell me about the building and its age and, and so on? I'm also looking at the floor for vents, ventilation. You know, do we have registers and returns, and what are those kinds of, con what are the condition of those? Do they attach to the, fl the, the subfloor properly? Are they allowing air to come in from a crawl space or what have you, okay? So those are the kinds of things I'm looking for. When I get down in the basement, I get down in the basement and I'm looking for things like um, the combustion appliances, what kind of condition they are, are they in? I'm looking at rim joists. Um, you know, I'm looking for more signs of moisture and those and that sort of thing. When I'm up in the attic, I'm gonna I may see things like this, which is uh, a knee wall. So you know, you have these uh, houses where you have a kind of a pseudo cathedral ceiling, and then the ceiling next door to the like the kitchen drops down, and so you have that vertical wall that's up in the attic, right? Well, in this particular case, looks like an electrician came along and put an outlet up there. Maybe there's a shelf up there with a plant shelf, and I've got some. The homeowners got some lights or something going on up in there. Well, this piece of insulation 
has, was removed and never replaced. Okay? So now heat is moving into the attic out of the living space uncontested. We also might see things like this. Okay, this is a chase. And what's happened is if you look carefully inside that hole, you'll notice that those walls don't have any insulation. That's because this is a chase that runs down through the center of a building, the center of a house. And what's happened, quite literally in this case, is the inside of this house is warming up what is supposed to be an interior wall. The heat goes through the drywall into this, the middle of this chase, warms up the air in the middle of the chase. That chase goes right into the attic and out into the world uncontested. And sometimes, in some houses, you'll be able to go down to the basement and look up into the bottom of this, look all the way through both floors, and you'll be able to look straight into the attic. Okay? Straight into the attic. And all these interior walls, uninsulated. We call this a thermal bypass. What you would do in this particular case is around this metal pipe, you would have some metal flashing, and then you would cover the rest of this with probably a plywood, okay? Something that would support weight, and then insulate over the top of it. And so what you end up doing is sealing this air. So this air still gets warmed, but we don't let it escape. This is a good example of what happens when you throw an IR camera onto an insulated, onto a wall. In this particular case, we see an unusually cold corner, which indicates, a, in this particular case, a water leak. So we're inspecting our exterior walls in this point. When we get inside, we're looking for stuff like this. Cat licking windows. We have condensation on windows. Okay? We're also looking for doors and air leaks around doors. When we're into crawl spaces and down in basements, I talked about looking for evidence of signs of water leakage. Okay? If we look at this, we still have both some dry spots and some wet spots. If we took insulation and covered that up without fixing the source of the moisture, what do we do? We create a mold factor. We have to do an investigation. We've got to find out where the water is coming from. Once we, yeah, we have to fix the problem first. You're investigating, right? So when you write up, when you write up your work order, your work order is going to say, fix the water leak problem, then insulate with, with uh, blanket insulation, right? Um, on the left-hand side of this slide, you're going to see some fiberglass insulation in a, in a rim joist, in a rim cavity next to a rim joist. Mm -hmm. You notice that there's some discoloration in that fiberglass insulation. Yeah. Okay, what is that discoloration? That's the air coming in. What, what, this hasn't been sealed. So what it's done is that insulation has become a very, expensive fiberglass filter. And you will sometimes go up in an attic and see this, especially with the pink stuff. You'll get up into the attic and you'll see big brown spots up in the attic. But you look the rest of the attic and you won't see any evidence of moisture. And on careful examination, you'll find that underneath that brown spot is a hole in the ceiling line, right? And that's air coming up through that, going through the insulation and taking the heat along with it. When we start investigative furnace, we're looking for things like this. This is actually, see how that outside of that boiler is burned? That's what we call frame, flame rollout. Flame rollout happens when the flame that's supposed to be inside the unit actually comes outside and burns the outside of the unit. And there's lots of different reasons for that. The right-hand side, you know, this is, this, is, this is classic stuff, right? We've got some paint going on there. That is a fire waiting to happen.
And you very well may run into something like this when you're investigating and uh, looking at furnaces and such. Water heaters. When we're looking at our water heater, there's a couple of things we want to look for. We're looking for rust because rusting shows that we're getting close to the life of our water heater. And our water heaters also have a 10-year lifespan. If we, they'll, sometimes they'll last longer, but the average lifespan of a water heater is about 10 years. Okay? So if a homeowner has a 10-year-old water heater, they need to start thinking about replacing it. The other thing we're concerned about is this. This is the pressure temp, P&T valve. Okay? P&T. That piece of pipe that you see attached to the P&T should be both attached and should stretch all the way down to within six inches of the floor. Okay, why is that? That thing goes off when we hit a particular temperature or a particular pressure to relieve the pressure within the, within the tank, right? So can you imagine if, you know, we got one of these things sitting up on a pedestal and it doesn't have a pipe attached, and we happen to be walking by when that thing lets go? Okay, even worse, let's say we have the one on the right, and the homeowner's two-year-old walks by when that thing goes off. We're going to check the temperature of the water. Our water temperature should be about 120 degrees closest to the water heater. 120. Why 120? Below 120, we start... Um, having danger of microbial um, growth inside the tank. Above that, we're just wasting energy. Combustion appliance zone testing. We do uh, a CST on the CAV. The CST is the combustion safety test. We do the combustion safety test on the combustion appliance zone, which in most houses involves one furnace and one water heater. And when we do that test, what we're trying to do is make sure under the worst conditions that those appliances do not backdraft carbon monoxide into the home. That's the basic concept of the combustion appliance, the combustion safety test. When we're inspecting our HVAC systems, we want to inspect duct, duct work returns, supplies, the filter, making sure things are clean. We're educating the homeowner about how often to change their filter and so on and so forth. When we're looking at duct work, we want to make sure that our duct work isn't kinked. This is a piece of flex that's been run through an attic over um, a, a member, a framing member, and now over time it's starting to collapse and cut off that uh, ventilation to the room that it goes to. It's quite possibly this is the room that your homeowner is saying is cold or is hot. Then we finish up with our blower door test, looking for air leakage. So we run our blower door test, we get our blower door number, then we go around the house and we look and find and document our, our air leaks, okay? And then we make notes of that. Following that, we go back to our appliance, our refrigerator, we take a look at how how much energy our refrigerator used over the time we were at the job site, or we make sure that we have the proper um, model, make and model number of the refrigerator. Then we wrap up with the client. So we talk to the client, make sure the client understands what we did. Um, I always like to have the client with me on the audit. So having the client with me on the audit allowed me to when I sent them the report, it was a reminder of the things that we already discovered while we were doing the walkthrough and while we were doing the blower door test. Okay? Even if a homeowner isn't interested in doing the walkthrough with you, they almost always want to hang out with you when you're doing the blower door test because that's just kind of cool. right? Okay. So we do that little wrap up with the client. Then we head off into the post audit phase. In the post audit phase, that's where we generate the report. It's where we document our findings, where we make our recommendations. We offer a contractor list. So 
This is who you can go to to make some of these, to get some of these measures implemented. Um, if depending on who we work for, we might even generate a bid for the work. Okay, this is how much it would cost for us to do it, and then we make sure that we offer to do a test out. And what that means is by a test out is if if a if we do a blower door test and we find out that the home is at 0.5 natural air changes per hour and then they have somebody come in and fix the air leaks, unless we retest, we have no idea whether what they did did anything at all. So that's what we do when we offer to do a test out. We are offering to come in and do yet another audit to see where they are now as opposed to where they were. We want to evaluate how they live. So there's a couple of things that we will do on that pre-conversation, okay? One thing we're gonna ask them to do is, do you have a wood-burning fireplace? Yes, I have a wood-burning fireplace. Have you burned a fire in it in the last 48 hours? Yes, I have. Okay, we need to wait at least 48 hours with no fire in your fireplace, and then I need you to vacuum it out very, very well before the auditor gets to your house. Okay? Because when you think about this, right, you have you burned a fire in your fireplace, and now I'm going to run a blower door and I'm going to pull a 40 mile an hour wind down your chimney. The ashes going to be everywhere. Not only are the ashes going to be in, everywhere, any tiny little ember that's still warm, we're going to start blowing air across it. It's going to glow. We're going to suck it out onto the carpet. And we're either going to start a fire at the worst case. At best case, we're going to leave little black spots on the carpet everywhere. Be very, very careful with wood-burning fireplaces. That's about the only thing that you would say, um, I need you to do this in advance for me. Okay? They may normally burn a fire in the fireplace, but in this particular case, we want them to clean it out, vacuum it out, and make sure that there's no ashes or embers or anything in that fireplace. Make sure that you keep in your personal preferences. You know, you walk in and you're like, Woo, it's hot in here! No, not a good, not necessarily a good idea, right? Or, ooh, man, it kind of stinks in here, right? You know, those, those are the kinds of comments that are, are really good to keep to yourself. Let's talk about the hoarder, okay? Let's talk about somebody who has lots of stuff in their house, okay? Everything that we know about energy efficiency still applies, okay? If they have registers blocked with stuff, that goes in, your report. That goes in our, the report. You talk to the homeowner and you say, you know, in order for this to, you know, you, you mentioned to me that this room is kind of cold. Well, I noticed that a few of your registers are blocked, okay? Now, if they're an organized hoarder, right, they might be able to move things three or four inches left or right, to clear the register, and now their room is warm, right? We've done, we, they haven't asked us to help them come get rid of their stuff. Your report's going to say, homeowner needs to move items from over the top of the registers. It's all going to be part of your overall recommendations, right? So you're going to recommend that, you know, air sealing be done on certain things. You're going to recommend you know, weather stripping, and you're going to recommend uh, insulated window coverings and more attic in the insulation, in the, in the, uh, more insulation in the attic and more insulation in the walls. You're going to have more than just, you're not just going to walk in and say, uh, yeah, you need to move this stuff off the registers and I'll be back, <laughs> right? You, you're going to do your full audit, and then you're going to offer to come back after all of the measures have been done and do a follow-up. Air is extremely resourceful, right? And it will take the path of least resistance. So if you give it a path, you give it a way to get into the house, it'll use it.
we're going to talk about a house as a system. And we're going to talk about the fact that the hole on the outside of the house may be over there, but the air that comes in through that hole comes in through a hole on the inside of the house over there. The question was, do we need to drill a hole or do we need to really, do we need to check every single wall for its insulation level? And the answer is, it depends. And I'll tell you why. Because I like to tell stories. I'm going to tell a story about a house that I did an audit on. The house looks something like this. When you walk up to the front door, actually, it was more like this, okay? So you walk up to the front door, come in the front door, and inside the front door, it's kind of almost a one-room area, okay? It's an office going on all kind of off in there. And when you go up to the wall, you knock on the wall, brick walls. And on the, all the electrical is surface mounted, okay? They've got an old fireplace in here that, you know, they've made into a gas fireplace with an insert and that sort of thing. And so the homeowner talked about this room over here. And over in this room, it's always cold, okay? So cold that they don't actually use that room as a bedroom. They simply store things in it, okay? So go around the corner into this room, and this room is about 15, I'm serious, 15 degrees colder than the rest of the house, okay? Now, remember, this room was brick, right? Go around the corner into that room, and you knock on the wall, and the wall's hollow. So then, because I'm not working for a weatherization agency and I can't pull a four-inch hole in the wall, I pull an electrical plate, go in next to the wall plate, the, next to the electrical box with an electrical-friendly probe, okay, and it's actually two by fours. A two by four wall. Go in with my hook to figure out what kind of insulation is in there. I get nothing. Okay. It's an inside wall, right? No, it's this is exterior wall. Okay. Checking an exterior wall. Nothing. Okay. So then we get around to this side of the house. This side of the house, it's got a vaulted ceiling going on up here, and it's fancy, 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 okay? Knock on the wall, hollow wall, open up an outlet, go in with the electrical-friendly probe, and I got two by sixes. Go in, grab our hook, and we have um, fiberglass. We got the yellow fiberglass, the John Mansfield in this part of the house, okay? Start talking with the homeowner. This is the original house. This is the first edition. This is the second edition, okay? So now, when I say it depends, it depends on how many phases your house has. This particular house has three phases. That means three tests. Now, you might have a situation where you, you don't have something like this, but you have a house where they came in and they popped the top. You know what I mean by that? Yeah. So they have the original house, they pop the top off, and they build a second floor. Okay? So that's the... Um, that's the rule. How do, you, how do you know how many times to check? You look at how many phases of construction you have. And up until the middle 70s, actually, gas was cheaper than insulation. So well into the middle of the 70s, you will find houses that were built with no insulation whatsoever. 
no insulation in the walls. Sometimes you'll run into just a little bit of insulation up in the ceiling. I mean, you'll have, you'll have insulation and you'll have two by fours and you'll still be able to see the top of the two by fours. I mean, like just two or three inches of insulation. Folks want to be able to do some of this stuff on their own. So being able to identify what a homeowner can easily do and what they need a professional to do is an important thing to be able to identify. And now you're going to go home and you'll do some of this stuff at home. And when you get out into the field, you'll be able to tell a homeowner, maybe they're a single mother. Don't worry about it. You can do it. I did it. Let me, tell, let me tell you about how to do it. Let me tell you about who to talk to. Let me tell you about where to go. Typically, the way it happens is you will write the report on your laptop or computer at home. And then you will submit that report some way uh, electronically. Are there tools for generating a report, basically, right? And there are. There are a number of tools, and the number of tools becoming available is getting larger. I was actually on a uh, conference call earlier uh, last week where there were a number of software vendors who were offering auditing products. Some of those auditing products are simple spreadsheets. Okay, report writing are simple spreadsheets. Some are a little more complicated, and they work with uh, pad computers. And some are complicated such that they will actually do inventory control and you can hook them into uh, accounting and inventory software. Okay, so there's the, the amount, the number of tools available to you as auditors is growing. And which tool you will use, again, depends on the agency and company that you're working for. Obviously, if you're self-employed, you have far more choices than if you're working for someone else. In this particular case, it depends on the agency that you work for. If you're working for strictly an auditing body, then likely all you're doing is gathering information and you're going to write a report and it's going to be the homeowner's responsibility to take care of it. If you work for a um, weatherization agency, a government agency, then you might be doing some of the work yourself as the auditor, or you might simply be writing the work order for the crews coming behind you. Okay? If you work for a weatherization company, then likely as the auditor, your job is going to be to gather the information, write the estimate and the work order, and sell the customer and get the check. Right? So it depends. I mean, all of those folks, all three of those agencies have auditors, and you have your basic function, which is to gather information. For example, I worked for a weatherization company. So my job was not just to gather the information, but to make the sale. I was, I was energy auditor slash sales rep. So I could do two houses a day. I rarely scheduled two, two houses. Because part of the reason I was there was to educate the customer, develop a relationship with the customer, Okay? Because I don't want to just, I'm not just there to collect my check from, right. for, for doing the audits. So I'm not trying to do the audit as fast as I can. I'm trying to make sure that the building occupant, the homeowner, gets what they need out of the audit. Oh, yeah. If they're happy, they might refer you to another. And they might refer me to somebody else. You know, most importantly, I want them to say, yes, I want to do some, at least some of these improvements. Right? Because, after all, if I go out and I do an audit, any of you guys, you go out and do an audit, and you find energy-saving measures for the homeowner, and the homeowner says, thank you very much, and throws your report in the drawer and doesn't do anything, what have they benefited? Part of the reason why we're in this is because we're concerned about the environment in general. Who's not concerned about the environment? Right? Okay, we may not necessarily be tree huggers, but we see the value in doing this. So if they want to hire somebody else, more power to them, right? At least it's getting done. So that was my point of view, right? But, um, for example, if you work for specifically an auditing body, then what, it, what your schedule typically will look like is you hit the road at 8 o'clock, you get to the homeowner's 
You knock on the homeowner's door at 9, uh, 9 o'clock. At 10.30, you're packing your truck. At 11 o'clock, you start writing your report. Okay? If you're fast, then you get to eat lunch. Okay? More than likely, you're eating lunch while you're writing your report. Okay? At 12.45, you pack up and you're, you're done with your report. This is the way it's supposed to work. You're done with your report. You're done with your lunch. You hit the road because you scheduled the two, your two audits close together. At 1 o'clock, you're knocking on the door. Okay? At 2.30, you're packing your stuff up. 3 o'clock, you're writing your closing report. At 4.30, you're on, your road, you're on the road to go home. So that's two reports in a day. Now, that's an hour and a half in the house. If it takes you two hours in the house and it takes two hours to write your report, you're never going to see your family again. Typically, if you are a W-2 employee of the agency or the company, they'll supply the tools to you. If you are a um, I, W-9, if you're a 1099 employee or 10 I, subcontractor, 1099 subcontractor, then likely you have to have your own tools. You have to have your own gear. And there's an in-between. Like sometimes you can go, if, if you worked as a 1099 subcontractor with your own gear, you can go to work for an agency that will pay you more because you have your own gear. But those are kind of far and few between. You'll, those, those, you'll, you'll be more like in a weatherization company if to, to be able to get some extra money as a W-2 employee. If you get yourself set up in this business, you're looking at seven to 10 grand initial investment to get the tools that you need. I own a small business where I do energy audits. I do HERS ratings and BPI audits. I've been in this industry for a little bit over two years now, specifically doing uh, efficiency consulting work. And I've got some uh, background in high-rise construction and things like that when I was a much younger lad. So a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the structural stuff I kind of understand and have been exposed to. But uh, other than that, you know, my background is, you know, I'm kind of like a lot of people right now where you maybe have done something else, you're looking to get into a new field. Um, I've certainly had a lot of interest in uh, renewable energy type things and the things that we can do to, to, to uh, be a little bit smarter with the way that we use our energy and the way that it impacts, you know, where we live. Um, but other than that, I, you know, I was a general manager in, in, in the restaurant industry for about 15 years. So um, I think probably my biggest strength coming into this was customer service skills, you know, and the ability to talk to homeowners and to build relationships with homeowners. You know, so there are a lot of things a lot of you have done in the past, whether um, you necessarily have a lot of experience in this industry that can help you out with this. And as long as you apply yourself to learning the things and, and getting as much exposure, I think that's what you struggle with a lot of times in the beginning for sure is, you know, every day, listening to Milo today, I learned something, you know. You just, there's just so much stuff when you're getting into a new industry, certainly for people who've been in the same industry for 15 years or 20 years, you know, or you've, you're, you're very experienced in one thing. There are a lot of new things to learn. I think there are a lot more entry-level jobs right now, you know, uh -huh. certainly in, in, in my industry. Um, there are a lot of people, like I say, who are trying to go out and start um, consulting businesses where you go around, you help homeowners. Um, a lot of, um, you know, where people are struggling at right now is just the slow, slow home, new homes growth.